The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, and then all right. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a short review problem on rugged landscapes, just so that you get some sense of the kind of thing that I would expect you to be able to do a week from today. And then, uh, and then we'll get into the core topic of of the class, which is evolutionary game theory, uh, and uh, we'll discuss you know why it is that you don't need to invoke any notion of rationality, which is kind of the traditional thing that we do when we're talking about game theory applied to human decision making. All right, then we'll. Uh, try to understand this difference between what a Nash tree equilibrium is in the context of game theory versus an evolutionarily stable uh, strategy in, in this context. And uh, we'll say something about the evolution of cooperation and uh, experiments that one can do with, uh, with microbial populations in the laboratory. Okay. Right. Are there any questions before, uh, before we get started? All right. All right. So just on this question of evolutionary paths. Uh, on Tuesday, we discussed the Weinreich paper, where uh, he, uh, he talked about sort of different models that you might use to try to make estimates of the path that evolution might take on that fitness landscape that he measured. Okay? So he measured the, the, this MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration, on all 2 to the 5 or 32 different states, and then tried to say something about the probability different paths would be taken. So I just want to uh, explore this question about paths in a simpler landscape where we actually, well, by construction here, we're gonna, I'm going to give you some fitness values just so that we can be clear about why it is that there might be different paths or what determines the probability of different paths are taken. All right, so what we want to do is assume that we are in uh, a population that is, is experiencing some Moran, pro you know, this Moran process or Moran model, a okay, constant population size. Uh, n equal to this case, we'll say a thousand, and <clears throat> let's say that the mutation rate is ten to the minus six. So each time that an individual divides has a one in a million probability of mutating, and that's uh, that's a per um, per base pair mutation rate. And I'll show you what a, what I mean by that, right? Uh, and in particular, we're going to have genotypes. Originally, when we discussed this, we were talking about just mutations, maybe A's and B's. Right now, what we're going to have is just a short genome, bit string length 2. Okay, so we might have 0, 0, which has relative fitness 1, 0, 1. All right. So we're assuming that this is uh, relative fitness as compared to the 0, 0 state. We're going to start in the 0, 0 state right. with 1,000 isogenic individuals, all genome 0, 0. And the question is, um, what's going to happen eventually? Okay. And uh, in particular, what path will be, uh, will be taken? On this um, on this landscape here. Okay. Uh, in particular, what we want to know is the probability of taking this path. What path will be taken? Mark. You can start thinking about it while I write out some possibilities that we can vote for. Uh, and I'll give you a minute to think about it, so don't.
Are there any questions about what I'm trying to ask here? That's right. Uh, yeah. So the, the yeah, if we wait long enough, it'll maybe the population will get there, and the one one genotype will fix in the population. Say, and we'll we'll, maybe, we'll we can talk a bit later about how long it's going to take to get there and so forth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, maybe you can uh, yeah. We'll we'll discuss the situations that where when we have to worry about that and when we don't and so forth. Um, for now, if you'd like. We can say that this is even just mu sub b, the beneficial mutation rate per base pair, uh, assuming that only the, the zeros can only turn into ones, right? But then, you know, after we after we think about this, we can figure out, you know, I, you know, if you know if that's important or when it's important and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, uh, all right, so we're starting with all 1,000 individuals have being in the 0, 0 state. Because now, now we're allowing some mutation rate. Okay, but the, so the mutation rate is so rapid that we have already Right, and you also have to think about, well, you know, th this first mutation, will it fix or not? Or, you know, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Uh, so you start out with all zero, zero, that, and then one mutation happens at that rate of the that exists. Um, and is that mutation, are we assuming that that rate is equal to zero, one? And then for example, uh, well, OK, so OK, all right. you're, you're, me, you're asking kind of what I mean by path here. Yeah, yeah right. So um, I'll say path means that the pop, you know, that, that this was the dominant probability trajectory of the population through there. And we'll also discuss whether um, it somehow is very likely is going to kind of have to go through one or the other of them. Um, you know, it, it, the, the probability of getting both mutations in one generation is going to be, you know, 10 to the minus 12, right? So that's, that's going to be a very rare thing, at least in, in this situation, you know, given these parameters and so forth. Um, you know, and then, and then there's another question, which is, will 0, 1 actually fix in the population uh, before you th later fix this population? And, and, will, uh, and actually, I think the answers to all these questions are in principle already on the board uh, in the sense that, um, right, because you have to, you, you know, there, there's a question of, oh, do we have to worry about clonal interference? Are these things neutral or not? And, you know, and so, um, and, and really, so this is in, in some ways a very simple problem. But in another way, you have to keep track of lots of different things and in which regime we're in and so forth, right? So it's, it, that's what makes it such a wonderful exam problem, okay? If you, if you, understand, if you understand what's going on, you can, you can answer it in a minute. But if you don't understand what's going on, it'll take you an hour, right? Yes? No? Maybe? Okay, well. Um, right, I just, I just wanna I'll give you another you know, 20 seconds. Hopefully you've been thinking about it while we've been talking. All right, do you need more time? Why don't we go ahead and vote? Uh, I'll, I think it's very likely that 
uh, we will not be at the kind of 100% mark, in which case you'll have a chance to talk about it and think about it some more. Okay, ready? Uh, three, two, one. Okay. Um, right, so we do have a fair range of answers. I'd say it might be kind of something like 50 50. Right, that's, that's great. It means that uh, there should be something to talk about. All right, so turn to a neighbor. Uh, you should be able to find somebody that disagrees with you. Um, and if, if, if everyone around you agrees, you can uh, maybe. Yeah, all right, so there's a group of D's and a group of B's here, which means that uh, everybody. Let's uh, fight. All right, so everybody thinks that everybody agrees with them, but you just need to you know, look a little bit more long distance. All right, so turn to, turn to a pseudo neighbor. You should be able to find somebody. There, there are roughly, it's roughly even here, so you should be able to find someone. Um, So I don't see much in the way of vibrant discussion and <laughs> argument. You guys should be passionately defending your choice here. Um, uh, I have Yeah, I mean, that's a higher order point. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, uh, uh, right. Well, it, it looks like people are having a nice discussion, but I might still go ahead and, and cut it short just so that we can, uh, we can get on to the evolutionary game theory. Uh, all right, but I, I would like to see where people are, and we'll, we'll discuss it as a group, so don't be too disappointed if you don't get to finish there. All right, I, but I do want to see kind of where we are, all right? Ready? Uh, three, two, one. Um, okay. All right, so it still is maybe fl uh, split roughly equally between D and maybe a B ish and some C's. Okay. Um, all right, can somebody, does somebody want to volunteer their, um, their explanation? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think it like the ratio of the the benefit of zero one for the benefit. Okay. Of sure. Okay. And and I just um, just to start out, which answer are you arguing for? Just oh, D. D. Okay. All right. So you're saying all right. You're saying D, and you're saying all right. Maybe because of the extra, the one zero is somehow more fit than zero one, mm -hmm. and you've taken some. Relative rates or ratios for some for for which reason? Well, I took 0.02 inverse 0.1, which is 0.6, and then um, and then I took the the effectivity of that is just the slightly less degree of the advantage of the zero. I see. So. Okay. Yeah. So no, I think that the the arguments there. I think there's a lot of truth to the arguments that you're saying. Um, there, yeah. It, it's it's a little right. Uh, you know. And another question is. All right, why might, you know, right, exactly why might it be one sixth instead of one fifth is, I think, a little bit hazy in this in here, right? It's okay, but, you know, it's, it's uh, close, you know, does somebody want to offer an explanation? So here that was an argument of roughly maybe why it's D ish, you know, because D is very different from B, right? We're order of magnitude different, right? So uh, can somebody offer why their neighbor thought it was B? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, if I were to revisit my test, um, so the probability for that first pass would be um, the s for zero one, so it's zero point zero two, which is one one fifty, multiplied by the probability that the other possible means of one zero would die out. Okay. Right. Okay. So there now there are two related questions. And I think that this explanation here is answering a slightly different question. Okay? So let me try to explain what the two questions are here. Right? So the, the question that you're answering is if you have kind of 998 individuals of zero, that, are, that are 0, 0 individuals, and you have one that's 0, 1, and you have one individual that is 1, 0. Right? So this is like these problems that we did um, a couple of weeks ago where we said, all right, you, know, you imagine in the population, you have a couple of different kinds of mutants that are present, maybe in one copy. Right? And, then, and then we were asking, well, what's the probability that this individual is going to fix? And what's the probability this individual is going to fix? And what's the probability that, uh, that these guys are going to go extinct and this one will therefore fix? Right? And, I think, and, and that's the calculation that, um, that you're describing, where you say, OK, well, in order for this individual to fix, he, um, he has to survive stochastic extinction, which, is, which happens with a probability of 2%. And the 1, 0 individual has to go extinct, which happens 90% of the time. Right? Um, and so, that is in, so this is indeed answering the question that if you had one copy of each of these two mutant individuals in the, in the population, what is the prob that, that's the answer to what, is the, what would the probability be that this 0, 1 uh, mutant would fix in the population. Right? Uh, but that's, that's a slightly different question than if we ask, all right, we're going to start with an entire population at 0, 0. And now these mutations will be occurring randomly at some rate. And then something's going to happen. Right? Somehow the population is going to climb up this fitness landscape. And we're trying to figure out um, the relative probability that it's going to take kind of one path or another. Okay, do, you, do, you, do you see the difference between these two questions? Right? Okay. Um, so th th indeed, th this is the answer. I think this is the correct answer to a different question, I guess. Is what, you know. um, and you know, so, so, okay, so it's going to end up being D. Okay? And, and, and now we want to try to figure out how to get there. Okay, because this is, it's, I think it, it, is, it is a bit tricky. Okay? And in order, in order to figure out how to get there, we have to make sure we, we keep track of, of which parameter regime we're in. All right, so there are a couple questions we have to ask. First of all, we have to remember that we start out with everybody, all 1,000 individuals in the 0, 0 state. So it's, there are initially no mutants in the population, but they're just you know, replicating at some rate. And every now and then, mutation is going to occur. Right? Now, the first one thing we, wanna, we have to answer, we have to think about, is whether these are nearly neutral mutations. All right, verbally, yes or no? Ready? Three, two, one. No. no right? And that's because we want to ask for if it's nearly neutral, we want to ask, is the magnitude of s times n um, much greater or much less than one, or in, you know, in particular, if, it, if they're much greater than one, as is the case here, then we then then we're in a nice simple regime. In this case, and it's easy to get paralyzed in this situation because there's there's more than one s, right? But you know, in both cases, s times n is much larger than one. We can take the smaller s, which is two over hundred, and s times n is twenty, right? So so s for the zero one state times n. Is that was twenty? That's twenty, right? Which is much greater than one. Okay. What this tells us is that if we do get this mutant appearing in the population, then he or she will have a probability s of surviving stochastic extinction. All right. So this um, so probability of surviving stochastic extinction, if he, if the individual appears, is uh, is equal to um, S01, which is equal to uh, z 2%. Right? Whereas for the 1, 0 state, uh, that's going to be um, 0.1. Okay. Now, this is assuming that the mutation appears in the population. That's the probability it will survive stochastic extinction. Okay. Now, just as a reminder, Surviving stochastic extinction roughly corresponds to this being, becoming established idea. And becoming established was what, again? No. 
What's that? It's when S1. Yeah, that's right. So, all right, so established, when we say established, what we mean is that um, established, this, this corresponds to saying that, that this, prob you know, this probability that we talked about in the, uh, before, this x sub i is approximately equal to 1. Right? So this question is how many individuals you have to get to in the population before you're very likely to fix. Right? And what we found is that that number established was, uh, went as 1 over the uh, selection coefficient. Right? So in this case, you would need to have you know, 50 individuals before you were kind of more likely to fix than not. So if you want to be much more likely, you might need twice that or something. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Okay. This is not important for this question necessarily, but it might be important at a later date. And so from your unit formulation, the whole point is that the number you need to become established is equal to the population. Yeah. So everything kind of works, right? OK, All right, so the way that we can think about this is now, OK, we have uh, this population, 1,000 individuals. They're dividing. At some rate, mutations are going to appear. Right? And now uh, we want to know, now we know if they did appear, the probability that they would fix. Right? This is assuming that there's no clonal interference. Right? Because if there's clonal interference, then surviving stochastic extinction is not the same thing as fixing. Because if they both appear in the population and they both survive stochastic extinction, then this mutant loses to this mutant. Right? That's the clonal interference. Okay. So do we have to worry about clonal interference in this situation? So remember, this was comparing the two time scales. Right? This was comparing the time to become the time between successive establishment events, which went as 1 over mu n s. Right? Uh, and the other one is the time between uh, the time to fix, which went as 1 over s log of n s. Right? So we can ignore clonal interference if this is much larger than that. Right? So, so no clonal interference corresponds to, to mu n log n s much less than 1. Right? No clonal interference, same as this statement. Is that right? Did I do it right? OK. Um, OK. So, so um, right, and once again, there, there are multiple s's, and it's easy to get kind of upset about this. right? But you can just use whichever s would be, which s would you want to use to be kind of? Right, because to, to be on the safe or conservative side, we want to take this to be as big as possible. So we take s actually as big as we can, right? Um, it, it's in the log, so it does, you know, details, right? But, um, okay, but we can see, okay, it's, we have 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the 3. And then this is the log of, a, you know, maybe 100, which is like 4 or 5. Is it closer to 4 or 5? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll say 5. And this is indeed much less than 1. Right? Okay. So indeed, there's, uh, we don't have to worry about clonal interference. This is, this is a wonderful simplification. Right? What it's saying is that the population is dividing. Every now and then, a mutation occurs in the population. All right? Could be either the 0, 1, or the 1, 0. But in either case, the fate of that mutation is resolved before the next mutation occurs. All right? So you don't need to worry about them competing in the population. Instead, just at some constant rate, they're appearing. Right? And given that they appear, there's some probability that they're going to fix. Right? So that leads to effective rates going to each of those two steps going to 0, 1, or 1, 0. And in particular, this is like a chemical reaction. 
okay, where we have you know, some chemical state here with two rates. There's the k going to 0, 1, the k going to 1, 0. Right? What we know is that we know the ratio of those rates. And that's everything we need to know to calculate the relative probabilities of taking those states. Because the probability of going, to the zero, of going through the 0, 1, that's what we want to go that direction, right? 0, 1, this is going to be given by k, 0, 1, divided by k, 0, 1, plus k, 1, 0. Okay. So this is how we get 1 sixth instead of 1 fifth, right? Because this thing is 1 fifth of that. Right, so it's like 1, and then 1, 5, and that's okay. Okay. So this is actually, in principle, not quite answering the question that I asked, because this is talking about the relative probability of the first uh, state, the first mutant to fix. Right? And in principle, it is possible that uh, from there, there's some rate of coming back, or they might not necessarily move forward on up that hill. Do you, guys, do you guys understand what I'm talking about? Because it goes from here to there. Because we really want to know about this next step, right? Going to, going to the 1-1 one, one state, right? But in this case, do we, do we have to worry about going backwards? No. And why not? It's very unlikely. And in particular, you can think, now that you're, now that you're here, you can talk about the rate of going to the 1-1 one, one state as compared to the rate of going to the 0-1. Right? And those are going to be you know, exponentially different. Right? Because just as this was a non-neutral beneficial mutation, that means that going from 0, 1 back is going to be a non-neutral deleterious mutation. Right? So the probability of fixing in the back direction is not 0, but it's exponentially suppressed. Okay? All right, so I think it's, it's very important to um, understand all the different pieces of this, uh, this kind of puzzle because it incorporates many different ideas that we've, we've talked about over the last, um, over the last few weeks. All right, if there are questions, please ask now. Yes? All right, so you're wondering about, OK, so this is uh, the fitness of the 1, 1 state was 1.2, right? So you're, you're pointing out that um, it's actually easier to go from the 0, 1 state to the 1, 1 as compared to the 1, 0 to the 1, 1. Right. Yeah. OK, right. So, um, all right, if, if anything, in some ways, this actually provides a bias going towards the 0, 1 state, because it's saying that if we do get to 0, 1, it's actually easier to move forward as compared to this other path. Uh, in practice, it doesn't actually matter, because this acts as a ratchet. Right? Because all these mutations are non-neutral, once you fix this state, or this one, you, you can't go back. Right? So, you, uh, so the population will move forward once it gets to one of those two states. Um, now, I mean, it would be a very interesting question to ask. if. Um, if we instead did a different arrangement, what would the rate of evolution be, and so forth? So, um, yeah. So, the, so I think it's it's. Um, but what you what you're saying is is certainly true. That if this took up all of the benefit going here, then it may not actually be somehow an optimal path in terms of the rate of evolution or something like that. Um, so we can. Um, yeah, I can. I'll think about that when designing problems. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So the um, we um, we are guaranteed that we will eventually evolve to the to this peak in the fitness landscape, and so what we were what we're asking here is which of these two paths is going to be taken. Um, I mean, I feel like I kind of proved it, although I understand that well, maybe nothing I said was rigorous. Um, And, and of course, there are non-zero probabilities of going backwards. It's just that they are 
reduced. And actually, you can prove, for those of you who are interested in such things, that, um, that, there, that over long time scales, there's going to be an equilibrium that distribution over all these states where the, um, the, prob the, the probability of being in a, in a particular state will, um, it goes as the uh, fitness, it scales as the, the, the relative fitness to the nth power. Okay. So, so we talk about these, these fitness landscapes as energy landscapes. Right? And indeed, you can, in this regime where you have slow, small mutation rates, um, then it's going to obey detailed balance, and it's actually a thermodynamic system. So then in that case, um, you can make uh, a correspondence between everything that we normally talk about, where um, fitness is like energy, and, and population size is like temperature. So the, the relative amplitude of being in this peak as compared to the other states is going to be, in this case, the, the ratios of those things is indeed described by the ratios of the fitnesses. And, and it's going to go as um, you know, kind of like 1.1 to the thousandth power, which is big. right? Which means that the population is really cohered at this, at this uh, peak in the fitness landscape. Okay, you, you want to know the, the, ra the rate that that's going to happen. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. Let's, let's do that. Um, okay. Uh, so, for example, what, let's, let's imagine that we don't have Okay, so let's imagine that we just have the 0, 0 and the 0, 1 states. Okay? All right, so just so we don't have to worry about going up the landscape. Right? And so what we have is we have a fit R is um, okay, relative fitness 1 and 1.02. 1 okay? Now what we want to do is we want to ask, well, um, what is the rate of going back and forth? Right? Well, the, um, okay, so, so the, right, the rate of going forward, well, we sample mutations at a rate mu, and this is mu only for that, this one state because we're now Pretend that we're not going to mutate this other one, just because you know, All right? So this is so mu mu rate mu n. You have mutations appearing, and times this s 0.02 is the probability that it'll actually fix in the forward direction, right? Um, and now what we want to know is the the rate of coming back, right? Well, the the beginning part's the same because we have mu n is the is the rate that you get this deleterious mutant in the population. But then we need to multiply it by the probability of fixation. Right? And, and the probability of fixation is, was this thing uh, x1, which was 1 minus. Now, this is r, but it's r in the other direction, so be careful. Because right? the general equation was 1 over. Okay. But now, r, instead of being 1.02, is 1 over 1.02, right? Um, and um, all right, so which of these terms is going to be dominant? Th this thing gets up to be some really big number, right? Is our problem? Okay, so okay, we can we can we should be able to figure this out though, right? Because this new r is one over one point zero two. So we, for example, have one minus one point zero two, one minus to the thousand, right? All right, so you know this is a negative number, but this is a negative number too, so. Right. Um, all right. So we end up with 0 0.02. Um, is it 200? Uh, yeah. You're keeping only the first. You know, um, which is since it's much larger than one, it's it's bigger than 200, right? I mean, do you guys understand what I'm saying? You, you know, you can't keep just the first term in a series if if the if the terms grow with number. Wait, what? This whole? Wait, which one? 1.02 is 1,000. Yeah. Oh, is it's four? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So it's it's one minus four. Yeah. So it's two over three hundred. 
OK, so all right, we, this is teamwork, right? Um, OK, so there's less than a 1% probability of it fixing. Uh, is, this, is this believable? Thousand. I think that you did it 1.02 to the hundred rather than 1.02 to the thousand. Okay. <laughs> no. I mean, do you not have it in front of you? Or? No, it's three peer review. Yeah, four times ten to the eight. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought that my calculator would be ten to the ten to the four. Oh, but four times ten to the eight. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Wow. This yes. Okay. Yeah. No. All right. So you know, I, I was I was gonna say this doesn't uh, right. So this is what I was saying. You always check to make sure that your calculation makes any sense at all. Yeah. So it's not this. Um, no. But it's it's tiny, right? I mean, it's. Yeah. Tiny. Okay. Um, yeah. Because this this didn't make sense because this was of the same order as. Well, well, this would be larger than one over n, right? So it's totally totally nonsensical, right? Um, you know, because one over n would be the probability of fixation of a neutral mutation. This is a deleterious mutation. It's not even nearly neutral, right? So it has to be much less than one over n, right? Okay. Uh, all right. So it was one, and it was one in a. This whole thing is ten to the minus ten or something like that. Yeah. Four hundred million. Four hundred million. Okay. Four times ten to the eight. Okay. Minus eight. Well, okay, whatever. I, you know, all right. it, it's it's you know it's ten to the minus nine. Some, it's something small. Okay, so um, so this times the probability of fixation, which was ten to the minus nine, right? So this is how you would calculate the rate of going backwards, right? There's some rate that the mutation appears, and you multiply by the probability that it would fix, and it's tiny. Right? Okay. All right. Any other questions about? How to think about these these sorts of evolutionary dynamics with presence of mutation, fixation, everything? Yeah. Could we handle a situation where some of the integers in one at the same time? Yeah. So this is this is what you do on your problem set with um, simulations. Oh, like yeah. Numerical. You know, I I, I think that it, it gets really messy with clonal interference. I'll say. Right, yeah. OK, no, this is an important statement, right? So, in the limit of, you know, as you get more and more mutations, when clonal interference is really significant, then you're pretty much just guaranteed to take the 1 0 path. Because if you have many mutants that have, I mean, the definition of clonal interference is you have multiple mutations that have established. And once you have multiple mutations that have established, then it's likely that one of them is going to be this. And if, they, if it's established, it's going to win, right? Um, but the other thing is that as you go up in that mutation rate, you, you don't even do successive fixations, right? So it may be that the, neither state ever actually fixes, right? Because it could be that the one zero state is growing exponentially, but it's a minority of the population, and it gets another mutation that allows it to go to one one, right? So in the lar as you increase the mutation rate, you can you don't have to actually take single steps; you can kind of like move through states, right? And you also then can uh, there's a whole literature of of uh, the rate at which you cross fitness valleys. So this is like tunneling in quantum mechanics or so, right? And it has a lot of the same behaviors in the sense of uh, exponential suppression of probabilities as a function of the depth and the width of the valley you're trying to traverse. And uh, there, there are some very nice, nice papers if, if you're interested in, in looking at this stuff. And one of them is actually in, uh, in the syllabus that I mentioned. Uh, I'm trying to remember who. It was Journal of Theoretical Biology, um, but I put it on as, as optional reading for those of you that are interested. Uh, OK, so what I want to do now is I want to switch gears to, so we can think about this evolutionary game theory business. Uh, and, and, and I think that the most important thing to stress when thinking about evolutionary game theory is just that um, this point that we don't need to assume anything about rationality. Yeah. Because you know, the, the puzzles that we like to give each other um, uh, you know, kind of, you know, in your dorm rooms, you know, Friday night, you give these logic puzzles to each other. 
Is that, is that what, do, I don't know. Cause it, yeah. All right, okay, let me just say, you know, back when I was in college, that was like all the cool kids were doing it. Okay. Um, right, but you know, and in, in these puzzles, you, assu you assume that there's hyper rationality, right? You, you assume that, oh, if, you know, if, you know, that this guy knows that I did this and that, and if I did that, he would do that, and then you end up, you know, and then, and then you have the villagers that are jumping off cliffs on the seventh day. You, have you guys done these puzzles? No. Okay. All right. Well, um, all right. So, um, right, so, so, so the point, though, is that people assume that when we're talking about game theory, you have to invoke this hyper-rationality that even, even humans don't engage in. Right? And I think that it's just very important to, to remember that when you're talking about evolutionary game theory, in the case of, um, of well, biological evolution, you don't assume anything about rationality. Instead, uh, the idea is that simply you have mutations that uh, sample different strategies. And then you have um, differences in fitness that just uh, lead to evolution towards the same solutions of the game. Okay, all right. So it's evolution to um, to the game solutions. All right. So like the Nash equilibria, for example. Okay. All right. All right. So it's not that we think that the cells are engaging in any sort of weird. Um, you know, sort of puzzle solving. Instead, they, they're just mutations, and the more fit individuals uh, spread in the population, uh, and somehow you evolve to the same or similar solutions to the um, to these Nash equilibria in the context of game theory. Okay. And uh, and and we can we'll we'll see how this plays out in a few concrete examples. Okay. All right. Now. Um, there, there are all these different ways of looking at these, uh, these games. Uh, one thing I want to stress, though, is that uh, n all the selection that we've been talking about in the last few weeks, that's all, that all is consistent with game theory in the sense that the, only d the idea of the game theory is that we uh, allow for the possibility that the fitness of individuals depends upon uh, the rest of the population. Okay? Whereas in all these calculations we've been doing, I told you, all right, here's I just gave you some fitnesses, right? So I said, here we have a 0, 0 state that has some fitness. 0, 1 has a higher fitness, and so forth, right? But uh, in general, these fitness values may depend upon what the, the comp population composition is. Okay? And in that situation, then you want to use evolutionary game theory. Okay? Uh, in many cases, people just assume that you can do, do something like this, right? that you can describe it as some fitness landscape. But uh, that, um, you can't do, the, do that if there's this frequency dependent selection, if there's any sort of evolutionary game interactions going on. Okay. All right, so um, I'll just, it's just important to remember fit, if the fitnesses depend on composition, uh, on, this is the population composition, then you cannot use, um, can, you cannot d even define a fitness landscape. Okay. All right. Then no fitness landscape. Right. For example, you can have situations where the population evolves to lower fitness. Right. So you can have a situation where if I tell you, all right, individual zero, you measure its growth rate or whatnot, its fitness might be one. Okay? All right, so this is genome and this is fitness. Okay. Now if I go and I measure the fitness of some other individual, different genome, right? So this is another strain of bacteria or yeast or whatever. And you say, oh, well, its fitness is 1.2, right? So this strain has higher fitness than this strain. Now, it would be very natural to assume that this strain will outcompete this strain, right? And indeed, that's been the, impl that's been the assumption in everything we've been talking about, okay? But it does not, it's not necessarily true. And that's the basic insight of evolutionary game theory, is that just knowing the fitness of a pure population is not actually enough information to know that it's going to be selected for. Because it's still possible that in a mixed population, the genome 0 may actually have higher fitness than the genome 1. And once you kind of study the, these things, it's kind of clear that it can happen, but then it's easy to then go back to the lab and forget that it's true. Okay. 
All right, and so we'll, we'll, we'll see how this plays out, okay? No, I, you know, yeah, so th that's, that's the other thing is that um, I like to just draw out these things as graphs because I think it's much easier to see what's happening and it's clear that things can be nonlinear, but the basic insights are all intact, right? So I, um, I, from my standpoint as kind of an experimentalist, don't forget about the exam. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that the, the, the more formal evolutionary game theory thing, these two-player games that you guys just read about, I think they're important because they tell you what are the possible outcomes of measurements or of systems, uh, in, even in the most simple situation where everything's linear. Now, um, when things are nonlinear, of course, you can get even richer dynamics. But in practice, you basically get the, the categories of, of outcomes that we saw there. Okay? And um, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. okay, so maybe what I'll do is. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is, is, is think about uh, competition between two individuals, A and B. Okay. And often we talk about uh, these things in the context of the two-player games, where, where we have A, B, C, D. Because uh, th this is really importing um, the kind of approach or the, the, the nomenclature from conventional game theory. And then, and then immediately applying it to populations, where you just assume that all the individuals have equal probability of interacting with everybody in the population. Right? So it's what you would get if you just had um, some two-player game that they, like, they study in, the ga in game theory, but then in a population of 1,000 or whatnot, you just made a bunch of random pairwise interactions. You had them play the game, and then you had them do that again over time. And then, then this is, this is the, the, the payouts that you read about uh, in chapter four are kind of what would happen in that in that sort of situation where everybody's interacting with everybody else with equal probability. Okay. Now, uh, the, remember that the way that you read this is that depending upon the strategy that these guys are following, uh, you you know you you get different payouts, right? And and normally what we'd say is that if, the, if this this could be, for example, strategy one and two, strategy one and two. All right. And this is telling us about the payout that the A individual gets depending on what he does and depending on what his opponent does. Okay. Now, we're not explicitly saying what the payout to the B individual is, but we're assuming that this is a symmetric game, so you could figure it out by looking at kind of the opposite entry. Okay. So if A follows strategy 1, B follows strategy 1, then A, individual A, gets little a fitness, right? whereas uh, B also gets little a fitness because they also do, it's a symmetric game. So the, the case that's different is when we're in, in the diagonals. Okay. Okay. And from this framework, you can, uh, you can see that there are going to be um, already a bunch of kind of non-trivial things that can happen, even, even in this regime where everything's linear. Okay. And the, um, you know, the, the probably best well-known of these is, is this prisoner's dilemma. Okay. Which is the standard model of, um, of cooperation in the field of game theory. All right, so there's a story that goes along with it. It's this idea that um, I don't know, you guys, uh, I'm sure you guys watch these cop shows where you have the, t the cops bring in the two accomplices and then they put them in separate rooms and they tell them that they have to, uh, they have to confess to committing the crime because you know, the guy in the other room is confessing and if he doesn't confess, then he's going to be in trouble, et cetera. Have you you've seen these sh cop shows? Um, and incidentally, in these questions, uh, you know, in, in when when cops are questioning witnesses, they're actually allowed to lie to the um, to the um, to the person being questioned, which feels a little bit weird, actually, doesn't it? I, all right, I, you know, I know. Okay, this is not relevant. Okay, um, <laughs> right. So the idea of the prisoner's dilemma is um, is that if you if you set up these uh, these jail sentences in the right way, then it can be the case that each individual has the incentive to confess even though both individuals would be better off if they, um, if they whatever, cooperated. Okay? And, um, and, and you can come up with some reasonable payout structure that has that property. Right? So, um, right. Um, okay. okay. 
right? And actually, um, and we'll we'll call this. Okay, so this is for um, individual one, say, or individual two, right? So there are different strategies you can follow, right? And do you guys remember? Uh, do you remember from the reading slash my explanation how to read these these charts? Okay. All right. Now the question is uh, just to remind ourselves. What is the Nash equilibrium of this game? All right, I know that you, you read about it last night. All right, is it, well, use your cards. Is it this C or is it D? Or is there no, Nash, right, no Nash equilibrium? You can flash something else. These are positive, fit yeah, yeah, right. So this is, yeah, right. So uh, and I, I kind of don't like the prisoner's dilemma as a story because it's not very intuitive because you have to actually specify the jail terms. And you have to remember the jail terms are bad, not good. No. So these are good things. Okay, These are years off for that you get as a result of doing one thing or another or something, right? Um, all right, but these are the, you, know, you want to you get big numbers. OK, ready? Three, two, one. All right, so at least we have, okay, we have a majority that are D, but not, it's not all of them. And, and, and I think this is basically a reflection, okay, and it is, D is indeed the Nash equilibrium. Okay, is to do this strategy D that we're saying here. All right now, the question is um, why, and uh, part of the challenge here is just understanding how to read these charts, okay? Now, first of all, the payout that everybody gets if everyone follows strategy D is what? Verbally, three, two, one. One, okay. So everybody gets payout one, right? Now, if you look at this chart, you say, well, gee, that is a shame, right? Because uh, in a one, it's just not the biggest number <laughs> that you see here, right? Um, and indeed, the important point to note here is that if both players had followed this strategy C, right, for cooperate, D for defect, right, then both individuals would be getting fitness um, three or payout three. So the, the idea here is that both individuals would, be do, it, would do better if they both played strategy C. But the problem is that that's not evolutionarily stable, or in the context of game theory, uh, that is uh, you know, cheatable in some ways. Okay? Right, so the, the reason that this is a Nash equilibrium is that you ask, right, so a Nash equilibrium, what it means, if you recall, is that if, um, if everyone's playing that strategy, then nobody has the incentive to change strategy. Okay? Right, so no incentive to change, to change strategy. So now you just imagine, all right, well, let's say that you're playing against somebody else. Or in the context of biology, it's a population of individuals following the D strategy. The question is whether you as an individual would have the incentive to switch to the other strategy. Okay? Um, and, and the answer is no, because what you have control over is this, col you know, this rows. Right? The column is specified by the rest of the population. Right? So you, what you have a choice, if you're in this state, what you have a choice of is to switch to, to the cooperate strategy, which would be to go up here. Right? So you have a choice to move up to this zero, this zero payout, but that's not to your advantage. Okay? Now, it's true that your opponent would get payout five. So your opponent would actually get, would do wonderfully, okay? but you would do poorly. So you would be selected against if you were to, if, if, if you imagine this being the context of biology, that uh, you have a genotype that are playing D. If you're a mutant that starts following this strategy C, you have lower fitness, so you're selected against. All right, so that's saying that the strategy D is non-invasible. Okay. Right. We can also think about what happens if we're a population of uh, cooperators. Right. Now everybody has high fitness, fitness three. The question is, what happens if there's a mutation that leads to one individual following the D strategy? Is he selected four or not? Four. Yeah. Yes. So the point here is that you always will have higher fitness if you, regardless of what your opponent does uh, in the context of a game theory situation, or regardless of the distribution of cooperation and defection in the population, it's always better to be a defector. Okay? Right. And, all right, so the problem here is it's always better to play D.
strategy deep. Okay. Now I really like uh, I like drawing the um, <coughs> the graphs of these things because I think it's just much more clear. And you can either draw the um, the fitness of uh, the two types minus each other, or just the raw fitness. Yeah. All right, so you're saying if this 5 were a 7 instead? Yeah. Right, then what you'd say, what you're saying is that, okay, so, so it doesn't change. I mean, the, the Nash equilibrium is still defect, yeah. right? Um, the only, the, the subtle thing here is that in general, we like to have it, um, be the, in terms of game theory, we like it when the mean of these two is, is smaller than yeah, this no, one. But that's, why I mean, that's why you're asking, okay, right. You know, like exactly, yeah, because. That's right. Exactly. Right. Right. So um, yeah. So that that's a that's a slightly more complicated situation because in, in that situation, then if you had two rational agents, say, playing this game, then you could alternate cooperation and defection. Right. And that's that would actually be the ultimate form of cooperation in such a game. Right. Because you could actually get a higher uh, payout by alternating. Right. So that's so it, it right. So we we we're, we've chosen the numbers as they are so that this subtlety is not an issue. Right. Does everybody understand the, the issue there? No. Okay. Right. So in the context of, uh, of evolutionary game theory, what we can do is we can plot as a function of the fraction of the population that's a cooperator between 0 and 1, say. Um, we can plot the, um, the payout for the cooperator and for the defector. Okay. So the question is, um, for example, I'm going to draw a solid line for the cooperator, dash line for the defector. Now, the, the question is, um, where, where should I, um, what should be the y-axis on either ends and so forth? Do you understand? All right, so what, what, you know, what should these things look like? I, I, I'd like to encourage you to, maybe I'll give you 30 seconds to try to draw what this should look like. So this is this is the uh, this is the payout or the expected payout. All right. So we're assuming that you're going to uh, interact with uh, randomly with the other members of the population as a function of the fraction cooperator. So then one minus that will be the, the fraction defector. All right. It, do you, do you understand what I'm trying to ask you to do? So is the scale on the right hand side supposed to be for the defector? Um, no. So I, this is just a legend or key or something. So I, I, I want you to draw something over here that's a solid line and a dashed line. All right, so it's just one scale. It's one, one scale. Right oh, yeah, sorry. I, I was just, yeah, okay. if you want, you can do I'm just telling you what's going to be a solid line and what's going to be a dashed line. Okay. And, um, and I'll give you a hint that up here is number five. This is going to be the expected payout for a lone, indiv you know, an individual, given the rest of the population is fo following some fraction co cooperator. Yeah. Do you guys understand what I'm asking you to do? Because I'm a little bit concerned that there are very few plots in front of Yeah. What is the FC? All right, so this is the fraction of the population that's cooperator. Okay. 
All right. Well, I've given at least given you a chance to think about it. Um, I, but uh, from looking around, I think that there's you know, maybe you're not quite sure what I'm trying to ask you to do. So I'm trying to plot the expected payout for an individual that is either cooperating or defecting based on the fact that the rest of the population has some composition between all cooperate or all defect. Okay. So it's it's the evolutionary game theory extension of this simple model. Okay. All right. So first we can ask, well, if the entire population is cooperating. All right, we want to know the fitness for a cooperator or a defector. Well, this is really just saying that we're all the way over on here, and we just choose between the two. All right, and the defector is the five line. All right, so, all right, so this is going to be a dashed line that's going to start from here, and then this is two and a half, three. All right, so this is cooperator starts here, and defector starts here. Do you understand what I'm, yeah? Okay. Now, OK, let's see where, all right, so now this is the limit of everybody else is defecting. OK, well, now the cooperator line goes to what? Verbally, three, two, one, zero. zero. OK, the defector line goes to one, right? OK, that line would. I started going the wrong direction, okay, but that's supposed to be a line. Okay. So this is an example of what this looks like for, a, um, for the prisoner's dilemma. And what you see is the defector fitness is always above the cooperator fitness. Okay. So for any comp population composition, defectors have higher fitness than cooperators. So evolution brings you to the pure defecting state where you have fit fitness one. And if you want, you could calculate what the mean fitness of the population is, for example. And the mean fitness starts out over here and ends up over here. Right? So the mean fitness decreases over time. Okay. Now, you can imagine that in, in, in the, the simple like two-player models, everything, all these are lines. But you can imagine that the only thing that's it's important are, are how, these, how these lines cross each other. So for example, you can, uh, there, there, are, there are only a few different things that can happen. Right? You, can have, um, you can have that, um, you can have that one strategy that dominates, which is what occurred here. And surprisingly, that does not mean that, you, that, that that strategy has higher fitness in the sense that you may evolve to a state of low fitness. Okay, that's what's weird. You can have coexistence, uh, or you can have bistability. Okay. So I'll give you uh, another example of this. All right. All right. So now we're just going to have two. We'll have strategies. We'll just say to the strategies. We'll call them A and B. And the question is, um, which, um, you know, what is the Nash equilibrium? All right, is it A, B, or um, C should be neither? D is both. Do you understand? What, uh, okay, I'm going to ask you. Okay, so. If, the, if this is the game or this is the interaction, is the Nash equilibrium A, Nash equilibrium B? For if you vote C, it means neither. D means both. Do you understand the question? Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it.
All right, are we ready to vote? All right, ready. Three, two, one. Okay. All right, so we have a fair distribution. I may not have us um, uh, vote, but uh, yeah, this one, in this case, it, uh, they're actually both. They're actually both Nash equilibrium. All right, so let's see this. If, if, ever, if both individuals or the entire population, say, is playing A, they're getting fitness 5. Question is, as a lone individual, you can choose to switch over and get fitness 3. Do you want to do that? No. Okay. So that means that A is going to be a Nash equilibrium. Incidentally, the difference between the so-called regular Nash equilibrium and the strict Nash equilibrium is that uh, for Nash equilibrium means that uh, no individual has the incentive to change strategy. A strict Nash equilibrium means that, um, is that any change in strategy leads to an actual decrease in fitness. Right? So it's a question of, of whether you can make neutral changes in strategy or not. Do you understand? The, yeah. Okay, so A, so A is a Nash equilibrium. Okay. What, about, uh, what about B? Well, in that case, everybody's getting fitness 1. Right? Now, uh, as a lone individual, what can you do? All you can do is switch. You can only, you know, as an individual, you can only choose rows, right? So you go up to zero. That's, that's a decrease in fitness. So that means that uh, strategy B is also um, a Nash equilibrium. Okay? All right, so there are two Nash equilibria in this game. And what does that mean about which regime you're in here if you convert this into an evolutionary game theory scenario? Ready, three, two, one. All right, okay. All right, so a majority is saying yes. This, this is a, indeed a situation in which you have bi-stability. Okay. Um, so does, what does that mean in terms of these lines if we draw them? All right, so this is payout as a function of the fraction that is playing the A strategy. Um, should the lines cross? Yes or no? Ready? Three, two, one. Yes. yes. Okay. And indeed, we, you know, I mean, the, the, in principle, the math that we do in all these situations is kind of super simple, yet it's, it, it, it's easy to get very confused about what's going on in all these situations. Right? So the idea here is that if, if the population is A, that means that the A here is at 5, right? It's 5. Uh, but then it goes down to 0. All right, so we'll see A. Whereas over here, B, here is 3. And then it goes to 1. Okay. Because these two lines cross, does that mean that you have by stability? Ready? Yes or no? Three, two, one. No. no. And why not? That's right, because you can also do the other thing, and then that leads to coexistence. Okay. Now, in some ways, coexistence um, is the most subtle of the situations, and that's um, for an interesting reason. Okay. So what? I I'm saying that these things can cross in the other orientation. Let, let's, um, let me, let me uh, put, a, um, put, the, put a matrix out there and then, um, and, OK. All right. So this is something that, for example, is a, what's known as a hawk dove game, or it has many other names. And we can maybe figure out what would be the hawk strategy and what's the dove strategy. But um, right, so now we want to ask the same question. Is A a Nash equilibrium? Is B a Nash equilibrium? Is it neither or is it both? And maybe I shouldn't have I'll cover this up so that you're not influ in case in case you actually did do the reading, uh, then I don't want you to be I don't want you to be influenced by this. 
Um, all right, so think about it for 30 seconds. All right, do you need more time? All right, let's go see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. All right, so most of the group is agreeing. In this case, neither are, the Nash, neither are Nash equilibrium. Okay. Um, so neither are Nash equilibrium. Okay. Does that mean that this game has no Nash equilibrium? Yes or no, verbally. Ready? Three, two, one. No. 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 Does not mean that. Right, this game has a Nash equilibrium, and indeed, all games like this have Nash equilibria. You know, if in any, like, I mean, this is what Nash won the Nobel Prize for, right? So this is the famous one-page paper published in PNAS. Um, if you look at it, like, I have no idea what it says, OK? So, um, but, um, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like a math, you know, he basically just pointed out that, oh, this theorem implies this, implies that, done. And, um, so, um, you know, it's just you know, it's good that somebody knew what he was saying. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble, all of us. Okay, um, right. So what he proved is that you know, that such games, even with big, you know, more players, more uh, you know, options and so forth, um, they have, um, they they always have such a solution in the sense that there is, there exists some strategy such that if everybody were playing it, nobody would have the incentive to change strategy. But you have to include so-called probabilistic or mixed strategies. Okay. Right. Uh, and, uh, and we can draw what this thing is. So just like always, all right, so if everyone else is following A, then A starts here at 3. Uh, and then it goes to 1. Whereas the B individuals, Starts at five and they go to zero. Okay. All right. So this looks very similar to that, but the, they're but they're rather different in the sense that in this situation, right, we had bi-stability. So if you if you look at the direction of evolution, depending upon where you start, you go to either all B or all A. Whereas in this, this situation over here, we have coexistence. Right? Does not matter where you start. So long as you have some members of both A and B in the population, you'll always evolve to the same equilibrium. Now, the important thing here that's, I think, interesting is that in a population, if you have genetic A's and genetic B's that are each giving birth to their own type, right, then you evolve to some coexistence of genotypes. right? So here, this is some fraction. F A star is the equilibrium fraction. Equilibrium fraction of A in the population. Okay. So this is a case where you have genetic diversity that leads to phenotypic diversity in the population. Okay. Whereas the mixed Nash equilibrium this is a situation where you have, in principle, genetic um, homogeneity. Right? So this is, a, this, is a, this is a single genotype that is implementing phenotypic heterogeneity. All right, okay. And indeed, one of the things that we've been excited about exploring in my group is this distinction here. Right, where uh, it's known uh, that in many cases clonal, you know, isogenic populations of microbes can exhibit uh, a diversity of phenotypes, right? As a result of, for example, stochastic gene expression and and bistability. Okay. Now the question is, um, so that that would be a, that's a, that's a molecular mechanism for how you might get heterogeneity. Another question is, what are the what's the evolutionary explanation for why that behavior might have evolved? Okay. Now in general, we cannot prove why something evolved. But we can make educated guesses that make te experimentally testable hypotheses. 
And for example, in the experiment that we've been doing, uh, we've been looking at uh, bimodality in expression of the galactose genes in yeast. Right? Um, and this, that's still, that was still a problem set in early, did, you, did, did, did we? Oh no, we removed that one this year. Yeah, OK. Well, all right. So experimentally, yeast are um, yeast uh, in some environments uh, bimodally or stochastically activate the genes required to break down the sugar galactose. And what we've what we've demonstrated is that if you make the mutants that always turn on or always turn um, don't turn on these genes, then they're actually playing a game where you actually you get um, you, where you get this exact thing where you get uh, evolution towards coexistence of those two strategies. And so that's saying that maybe the wild type that follows this stochastic you know, mixed strategy, it may be implementing uh, the solution of some game that is a result of such frequency dependence. Okay? There are other possible explanations to this. And we're, uh, in the next coming weeks, we'll talk about uh, this idea of bet hedging, that uh, given uncertain or fluctuating environments, it may be advantageous for clonal populations to have a variety of different strategies to cope with that uncertainty. And we'll, we'll talk about those models um, later. But since we're talking about mixed strategies now, I wanted to mention that. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Right. So mixed this the, the the Nash equilibrium mixed strategy plays, you know, A with probability, you know, so it's P should be equal to F A star. And right. Exactly. So it's so indeed um, the heterogeneity there can be implemented um, e either way. It's either coexistence of genoty genotypes following different strategies, or it could be one genotype implementing both, or it could be a mixture of those, actually. And indeed, uh, a characteristic of these of these situations is that if you're at so let's say that you have a a mixed uh, you know you have a genotype a population that has this genotype that is implementing the mixed Nash equilibrium following choosing strategy A with probability P that's that equilibrium fraction right what's interesting is that um, any individual in the population following any strategy has the same fitness okay so and of course that's kind of that's why this was an equilibrium. Right? This equilibrium is when the two strategies have equal fitness. Right? But the funny thing is that what that means is that it doesn't matter what you do right, at the equilibrium. Right? You know, depending on how you look at it, it's either super deep or super trivial. Right? But, but it's a weird thing that if you're at the equilibrium, or if, you're, if the population or the opponent is playing this Nash equilibrium in these games, then it just does not matter what you do. You can do A, you can do B, actually in any fraction. Right? So any, you know, since A and B have the same fitness, you can choose between them with, at any frequency you want, and you have the same fitness if the rest of the population is playing this uh, mixed Nash equilibrium. Okay? Um, and indeed, um, in this, there are, there are nice conditions for wh what um, makes it this Na Nash equilibrium. And I'll, I'm, you know, I'm going to just highlight that you should make sense of why it, it, it means what it is. So if the, the payout, the expected fitness or payout, uh, if you're following the Nash equilibrium against Nash equilibrium is equal to this guy. So that's what I just said. That um, it doesn't matter what you do. If everyone else is doing P star, you have the same, same fitness. Okay. Um, so that's saying it's, uh, it's a Nash equilibrium. Whereas um, there, there's another interesting kind of statement here is that. Um, Right. Well, it, it's an equality, which means it is a Nash equilibrium, because it, it's saying that you don't have the incentive to change strategy. It's true that you, you're not disincentivized. So it's a Nash equilibrium. It's not a strict Nash equilibrium. Well, it, it does. Ha it has to be greater than or equal to, and it's, and it's actually equal to. Right. The, the condition it has to be greater than or equal to, but it's equal to, which means it is a Nash equilibrium. That's right. So this is not the definition of it. This is, but this thing is true, which means that it's a Nash equilibrium. Right? Yeah. Um, and the, this other thing that's interesting is that, so this tells us that it, it's actually one of these ESSs. And um, if you have questions about, about this, um, you know, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, it's explained in the book as well. But okay. we are out of time, so I should let you go. But um, Good luck on the exam uh, next Thursday. If you have questions, 
and you want to meet with me, I'm available on Tuesday. So please let me know. Okay.